Uh, but our last two speakers here, one is Emily Williams, MD, a psychiatry resident at UCSF in an NIH-funded research training program where she's currently conducting an analysis of the effects of MDMA on therapeutic alliance, as well as serving as co-PI on an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD phase three tr tr clinical trial site. Evan Zola is a PsyD candidate at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He completed his pre-doctoral training at the Jung Institute in San Francisco, and he's currently in a postdoctoral fellowship at Access Institute. Both Emily and Evan have completed MAPS's MDMA training and will be co-therapists on the MDMA therapy for PTSD phase three team at UCSF. So let's just give people a moment to mill, and then if you all would come up here. Yes, 217. Yeah, if you, yes, I think so. Thank you. So thank you all for being here uh, for our talk on psychoanalytic themes and therapeutic alliance in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So we'd like to show you how um, both qualitative research and observations and quantitative research can be useful um, in and really complement each other in exploring a model uh, for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So I'll first talk about my quantitative uh, research project into uh, therapeutic alliance, and then Evan will come and, and share some of his emerging psychodynamic themes that he's seen in his uh, analysis. So Evan and I are both performing secondary analyses of an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD study that was completed by Michael and Annie Mithoffer um, in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it was a patient population of 24 military veterans, firefighters, and police officers, and um, they all had treatment-resistant PTSD. So as a little bit of background, um, some of the key components of MDMA-assisted therapy um, are that it, em it employs a non-directive approach um, to allow for the inner healer to work as the guide. Um, and, and this inner healing intelligence can be compared to the innate healing capacity of the body and psyche um, to heal itself. And um, kind of similar to um, a splinter when you pull a splinter out, you're removing the, the blockage and allowing the kind of natural healing ability of the skin and tissues to fuse and, um, and heal. Um, so in a similar approach with MDMA therapy, the therapists are removing the blockages to the healing process. Another component of MDMA therapy is the concept of the beginner's mind. Um, so the beginner's mind is really letting go of expectations um, that you have as the therapist um, and, and really allowing the knowing to come from the participant. So some of these are, are also key in psychoanalytic therapy. So the kind of open-ended context, um, the kind of responding to the immediate here and now experience, like really staying in the moment with the participant. and. Um, the, the kind of idea of free associating and allowing the unconscious to be the, the guide of the experience in psychoanalytic therapy um, and really kind of coming to a psychotherapy session or course of therapy with no memory or desire and allowing the um, unbidden experience to arise. So another key component is um, the processing of transference. Um, and what we've really seen in our, our review um, of these video is that in the MDMA sessions and throughout the course of, of an MDMA therapy, 
um, there's really more ease and ability to process this transference between the patients and the therapists. Um, so in contrast to psycho, a, a psychoanalytic approach, um, MDMA therapy uses limited interpretations. Um, and this is really to, again, like allow the knowing to come from the participant and, and not having any assumptions about their process. Um, so I'm going to lay out um, some concepts and then tie them together in a proposed mechanism of action for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, so we know that PTSD is associated with a limited capacity for trust. Um, participants are, are easily activated, um, have you know, fear, anxiety, uh, hypervigilance, and um, tend to avoid these difficult feelings. So through um, MDMA, the, there's a release of oxytocin, prolactin, and serotonin. Um, and without getting too much into the, the neurobiology, um, this kind of lends itself to a state of increased interpersonal trust, decreased defensiveness, a decreased fear response, and this enhanced positive emotional state within the participants. So the idea is that MDMA um, may catalyze this therapeutic processing and allow for participants to process um, these traumatic experiences while staying emotionally engaged, which was, would otherwise be very difficult, um, so without being overwhelmed um, by these difficult emotions. So in 2007, in um, a psychopharmacology journal, the proposed benefits of MDMA were outlined. And um, so some of the qualities like the self-compassion or um, empathogenic quality of MDMA was connected to a possible deeper contact with the true self, um, enhanced recognition of, of positive aspects of the self, um, the, the quality of, of MDMA reducing fear response, um, really allowing participants to reevaluate the difficult um, memories, tr you know, traumatic experiences that might emerge while under the influence of MDMA. And um, the quality of, of the stronger interpersonal bonding or trust um, could possibly facilitate um, a therapeutic alliance, leading to more, th more rapid therapy um, and possibly fewer um, sessions required. So what do I mean when I say therapeutic alliance? I know that a lot of folks in the audience are, are probably therapists, but to give a little bit of background. Um, so the therapeutic alliance um, in a psychotherapy session or a course of psychotherapy, um, the patient and the therapist are working together to solve the patient's problems. And this relationship that's built is the therapeutic alliance. Um, it's also called therapeutic bond, um, treatment alliance, working alliance. And what we know is that um, a strong therapeutic alliance correlates with a positive response in treatment outcomes. So the stronger the bond or the stronger the relationship, the better the relationship between the patient and the therapist, the better the overall outcome and, how, and, and the, the more effective the, the therapy will be. So kind of tying it together, the idea that um, you know, prolactin and oxytocin release could enhance this bonding between the, the therapist and the participant and really having a stronger therapeutic alliance in the, the context of an MDMA um, course. So how can we measure therapeutic alliance? Um, typically, there is, it's manually coded. You take transcripts of sessions and kind of painstakingly go through and, and identify um, different markers for, for alliance. There's also um, the working alliance inventory self-report. That is a self-report of the participants. They kind of, um, so this process is really tedious and, and time consuming. And um, in 2016, Kuhl and Thatcher um, proposed a model for connecting therapeutic alliance to what is called interpersonal synchrony. And so Interpersonal synchrony is the idea or the concept that any two people in a relationship, so having a conversation in a romantic relationship, in an um, you know, employer-employee relationship, or in a psychotherapeutic relationship, 
um, people tend to spontaneously synchronize their language, their vocal pitch and tone, um, and even their body movements and, and mannerisms. And so in this kind of mechanism or, or kind of idea of, of interpersonal synchrony, um, there's a, a common language that develops between the participant and, and the, um, or the, the patient and the therapist. Um, there's mutual sharing of subjective experiences, so more I sharing, more my sharing than um, like as time goes on. And there's even affective co-regulation, so synchronized breathing patterns, shared mannerism, so mutual smile, mutual gaze, um, hand gestures, things like that. Um, and so for my um, analysis that I'm currently working on, um, I am taking video and transcripts from the study I mentioned before um, of, of military veterans and, and um, first responders um, and looking at non-drug prep sessions and experimental sessions using MDMA and also the um, integration sessions that are also non-drug non um, and probing using a word count program called Luke um, to look for verbal markers of synchrony. So we type words, um, I, my, um, the, the development of this um, common language between the therapists and the participants. Um, and I'm also planning a further analysis of vocal synchrony and tone matching with one of our lab's collaborators. So kind of tying everything together, um, I've kind of put together this proposed psychotherapeutic mechanism of action. So the idea that um, MDMA, the medicine, um, stimulates a, a release of oxytocin, prolactin, serotonin, which kind of leads to this increase or enhanced um, interpersonal trust and bonding between the participants and the therapists. And in conjunction with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, um, there is enhanced therapeutic alliance, and this, the focused intention of that, that modality of therapy um, really provides this holding and containment environment that sets the stage for um, more deeper and faster psychodynamic processing than would otherwise have occurred. Um, and so to talk a little bit more about the psychodynamic themes um, that have emerged in MDMA sessions, um, Evan Sola is going to, to share a little bit of what he's seen. Hi, I'm Evan. Good to see so many uh, familiar faces in the crowd. Um, so I have about 10 minutes to share a condensed version of my data, so I'm going to jump right into it. I'll give a little background, um, a little background of where I'm uh, have, having my understanding of these emerging themes from. I've been the lead adherence rater for MAPS for about the last seven years, since 2010. And what that means is that I've rated therapists on their ability to stick to a treatment protocol, the treatment manual, and that's largely based on their ability to use a non-directive approach, um, a provision of safety, and um, a treatment alliance, therapeutic alliance with uh, participants. Um, also doing uh, this work for my dissertation, doing the thematic analysis with the combat veteran study in Charleston with Michael and Annie Midhofer. Um, some limitations of what I'll be presenting is that I'm only using three participants from the study, um, all of them being positive responders. So at study's end and at long-term follow-up, they no longer met criteria uh, for PTSD. Um, so really robust diminishment of CAP scores over the course of, of treatment. Um, so what I'm trying to get across is uh, uh, the richness of qualitative data and what's being said in these MDMA therapy sessions. Um, so I'd like to give an abbreviated taste of the language from combat veterans, from their direct experience. And um, I should say something about the emergent nature of uh, qualitative data. So basically that means we bracket theoretical assumptions when looking at and coding the, the uh, MDMA sessions. So um, holding theoretical ideas till the end and um, really trying to stay close to the language that participants use. And I'm going to share some of that today. Um, so I'm going to blow through the five themes that I've seen most common. There's other themes that I'm using in my dissertation, so this is a little condensed. 
And um, so I'm going to do it in a kind of zoomed in way, uh, a zoomed out way, and then kind of zoom in and use participants' language. Um, so first we have an image here of, of Kronos. He is the, the God, also known as Saturn, the God who devours his son, his children. And so this kind of represents a, a self-attack or a sort of autoimmune function, you could say, of the psyche. So the, uh, the self attacking the self. And that's uh, kind of re- relating that to dissociative defenses, or, um, part of the PTSD process. So vulnerability gets kind of locked away or caged up. Um, the symbol, a- a- ancient uh, symbol of initiation, the spiral, so this kind of represents a loss of the known order. So this comes up a lot of times when the MDMA comes on and uh, the defense structure starts to crumble and uh, when MDMA is sort of offering a sense of connection, um, that's dangerous when when you have PTSD. Um, The third theme is something about a calm within a storm. So within that panic, conflicted place where paranoia is big and uh, anxiety, panic, sometimes claustrophobia, there's a a sudden facilitation or ability to stand in that kind of stormy place. Um, another theme I've uh, encountered quite often in the sessions is what might get called dreaming in psychoanalytic literature, so the ability to think or put into narrative, um, sometimes visioning, re-experiencing, reliving um, in a way where thoughts uh, that were previously unthinkable become thinkable. Um, and, and emotion that's uh, difficult and self-states start to be uh, experienceable. And the final theme is, I'm calling it pro-social experiencing. So um, another way I've put it is a democracy of affects or self-states. Parts that were kind of caged up become accessible for experiencing. So this is sort of representing the boy being let out of the cage. So this is interpersonal but also intra or intrapsychic, intrapersonal. So to kind of zoom in on this first theme, the dissociative defenses with Kronos, there's a lot of, this, is, this slide's kind of for the psychoanalytic nerds in the room, myself included, um, splitting, spoiling, identification with the aggressor, attacks on linking, archetypal self-care, archaic superego, Saturn or Kronos, or the static masculine. So these are uh, Beyond, Sandor Ferenzi, Jung, Melanie Klein, um, in short, these are just different. It's a personified metaphor of a protective function that becomes persecutory when it can't relax, when you're coming back from wartime and you're in peacetime and um, can't integrate or, or re-experience the vulnerability that you maybe had as a child. So in a sense, a part becomes dissociated, split off, caged, numbed, sequestered to the underworld if you prefer a, a Jungian uh, lingo or forensian. Um, so directly from participants, uh, after firefights and watching friends die, I would go duck behind the hooch. That little aspect of me that was a kid was scared and crying. I would just be mean to it and tell them to suck it up. So you hear that phrase a lot with combat veterans. They had to suck it up. So it really um, exemplifies the part of the self having to kind of go away or be sort of caged up. I feel like I can get a, I can get a shield or a wall up around me. I feel right here in my chest, then hitting the solar plexus, it's a gripping feeling. So I see this as sort of the somatic component of the same phenomena. Uh, I'm used to being on guard all the time. My battle is that I didn't want to shut my mind off. So used to it. There's a staying up, I can't fall asleep. I never felt like I could let that guard down. So a guard is sort of the protective function. A guard, a jailer, sometimes it comes up. The next theme, oh, that went backwards. The next theme, uh, conflict, overwhelm, uncontainment. So again, the MDMA elicits hope and connection. This is conflictual for someone with uh, treatment-resistant PTSD. It starts to get really scary. Um, A lot of panic comes, sometimes claustrophobia. Uh, So from the participants, I'm controlling my body right now. I'm battling. It feels like an inner battle with myself. I had this really intense feeling come over my body, and my heart started beating real fast. I started to feel afraid. I'm just blown away by how I had that rushing feeling of anxiety, kind of like I was going to have a panic attack and I need help. I'm freaking out. So just a lot of painful psychological experience here and um, leading into the next theme, a sort of tolerance of that conflict and a release. So 
the panic gives way to a sort of facilitation within that kind of stormy emotional place. Um, from a Jungian perspective, we talk about a tension of opposites. So the anxiety and the panic uh, start to exist alongside of something like a relaxation, sometimes a good feelings, um, a sense of joy even. And so um, you could also call this a sense of containment, sort of Bionian. I just feel really relaxed. I'm going back and forth between like anxiety and relaxed. I feel really relaxed. I felt really, really the anxiety. Now I feel the exact opposite. It definitely went like waves. And the amount of anxiety would equal how relaxed I got. So something there uh, seems to be happening between the two sides where they start to coincide with each other. Simultaneous uh, relaxation and anxiety. Once I started breathing, I, I've never felt that before. I literally felt my heartbeat start to slow down and relax. It's hard to put words to it. Things would come up, and then every time they would just blow away like sand. So the kind of beautiful uh, poetic language being used. A lot of the time it was a good feeling. It could be more intense feeling to a less intense feeling. So something just shifting around. Uh, anxious, relaxed, anxious, relaxed. Uh, but there's a reduced reactivity to that anxious place. Um, so the next theme, um, enhanced reliving. So again, dreaming, visioning, linking, or ability to think or, or uh, engage a metacognitive process around the trauma. You can think previously unthinkable thoughts um, and relive the experience in a way that feels safe. So from the participants... This just feels like a different type of consciousness almost. I'm just thinking, but don't have any anxiety. The drug helps me see that, like knowing what's going on, I can think with this mindset I have now. I feel like I understand it a lot better. So that's a, a rare experience for someone with really um, treatment-resistant PTSD, just a clarity of mind that suddenly comes over them. Uh, MDMA helped by changing the thought process I was having about a lot of these things. I think it gave me more room to think openly without psychological labels. So sort of more, more of the same. It's almost like dreaming, just a little bit. Just a kind of opening up uh, of the subconscious and allowing things to come out more easily. It's pretty profound. And finally, uh, my theme, pro-social experiencing or democracy of affects. S uh, parts of the self previously split off are becoming re-experienced in a way that feels good and safe. Um, the child is sort of let out of the cage. So this is a long quote, but I'm going to read it because I consider this sort of the quintessential MDMA for PTSD uh, quote in combat veterans. This really kind of captures the, the PTSD process, but also the healing of it. So I've had that part of me locked up in jail, and it's dark, but it's got bright red eyes and just really evil. I'd put that person there, and I went to it and just opened the door and hugged that person. And then the eyes just faded away. It no longer had an evil look to it. I visualized both of us taking apart the jail cell and really becoming friends. Then I visualized that image of me coming out of my hip and it stabbed me in the side. I just had a strong visualization of me reaching out where the knife was in my side and taking it out. And it took my hands off his neck and didn't choke it anymore. I really embraced it and part of me realized I was keeping him locked up because I was so afraid of him. I was just making it worse for him and it was more beneficial if we worked together. He was really amazing. I thought I was being a peaceful person, but I didn't realize how much I was punishing that aspect of me. I think maybe in Iraq I saw what it was capable of and think I was too afraid. A part of me just feels so bad that I, didn't, that I did that to him. So a lot of remorse about um, what's happening to a, a vulnerable part of the self and an ability to um, take it out of the cage. I mean, it's, it's a, just a really... Um, wonderful metaphor um, and sort of captures what's said by a lot of uh, participants in the study. So again, I'm trying to get across um, what maybe sounded like a linear process, and I, I think sometimes it does come across that way, but mostly it's been pretty nonlinear, and simultaneously these things are kind of happening at once or kind of cyclical. Um, so disconnected and kind of self-attack, a lot of anxiety and panic when the defense structure starts to come down, a facilitation uh, of a uh, uh, calm within the storm experience, standing in the anxiety, starting to feel good, and then a, 
giving way to a, a ability to think and sort of dream or narrate, and then uh, reaccessing aspects of the self previously um, cut off, split off, uh, not okay to, to be experienced or thought about. So to loop back around and uh, to Emily's uh, proposed method of action, MDMA through facilita- facilitating agents like uh, prolactin, oxytocin, serotonin, increase uh, the, the bonding, uh, and that is a part of the therapeutic alliance. And this is deepening the sense of containment with the participant and really allows a processing to happen that uh, allows parts of the self that were previously split off to come back into the realm of experiencing and, and healing to occur. Um, thank you. I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah. We can take a few questions if you want to. Okay. Please go to the microphone. Okay. Uh, so, um, a really interesting uh, your speech. Uh, in regards to um, soldiers that are having PTSD, not because of what they have seen, but what they have done. I mean, I spoke to a soldier who's involved in the Battle of Basra, and he was dropped into a marketplace, and his rebels were shooting at him from in civilians, and he's like, I, had, I didn't have, I just shot, I was over me, or I was ever going to die, or, you know. Um, the, the the guy that was shooting me was going to die, and obviously he said like a lot of civilians got shot, and he had this, all this guilt over the fact that he'd done these actions. How have you found MD MDMA? How has that helped soldiers that may have actually committed violent acts, not been just the observer? Has that shown to be quite effective at, at helping those people as well? Or I would say, yeah, everything that I shared today applies to those folks. Yeah, a lot of times the, the most difficult stuff to process is, is um, you know, times when they have engaged a, a firefight and people have died on both sides. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. and as far as, like, set and setting, where have you found the most effective set and setting? It obviously, is a, a therapy room with a psychotherapist, but apart from that, say, like... Is there any other set and setting that you, you've noticed had great results? So I think we can, pro- we can only speak to the kind of therapeutic context of the, the research that's being done. Yeah, um, that's a bit too off, off, off base. Okay. Cool. Some people say loving friends helps. Loving friends. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you have a question, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, you said you have always only looked at three Responders, if I understood it right? Sharing this data today was just um, quotes from three participants. Okay. But the, so, the, the analysis that I'm doing is of all of the participants. Okay. If you were to look to only non-responders, which part of the five parts that you have looked at would you expect they have the less? In non-responders? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would, I would imagine there would be a, a more of a caught-upness in that first theme which is kind of there throughout. Anyway, it's not like a linear process of going into healing or reconnecting with vulnerable aspects of the self. It's a lot of looping back around to the defense structure, kind of wanting to set back up, and then a, a relaxation happening, and then it kind of setting back up the defensiveness. So um, maybe, maybe more of that and some more dissociative phenomena. Would you expect that something of that would be lacking? Some of the parts would be lacking? Some of those themes? Mm-hmm. Oh, certainly. I think this was kind of quintessential themes that come up, but I think part of the um, trust in the inner healer and the non-directive approach means that we don't really know exactly what the process of healing is. This is kind of like putting some stages on it, but it looks a lot of, a lot of different ways. Some, some participants come in and don't say anything for eight hours, hardly. They go inward and have a process they don't want to talk about, and then they might write in, uh, weeks later and talk about the, the visions that they were having or the, the release that they were having. But um, sometimes um, it's quite, quite different and variable. Yes, because I was wondering, because in most of other cognitive or more cognitive behavioral models of explaining PTSD, the main theme that comes again and again is reliving. So reliving. I was wondering that 
if you have seen patients that didn't have this part of reliving in the MDMA study, how did they respond if they were more of the non-responders? That would be an, an issue to look at, I guess. I don't know if I can connect it to the non-responders, but... Um, it was just, just a question. Uh, but yeah, I think sometimes yeah. people just have really big relief experiences, so yeah. they've, they've kind of gone through the reliving uh, quite a bit, and it seems to be a, a major component of the healing process, but um, again, I, I think a lot of people come in and have uh, a big relief kind of experience that's a, a major part of their process. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Hey there. Uh, you did a really great job of uh, covering in particularly sort of the interpersonal with the first bit, right, with the relationship, and then a little bit more of the intrapsychic in the second part with what's coming up in the inner healing intelligence. And, uh, I've been, and you present a really interesting model that kind of makes a lot of sense, right, that people would be feel more comfortable within the relationship, and then afterwards this material or that kind of intrapersonal, uh, intrapsychic process can kind of emerge. And I was wondering a little bit about, um, about that and also... Uh, in particular, like sort of psychoanalytic theory is, is a developmental theory, but it tends to focus on pathology. And I've personally, in my sort of readings and seeking, I've been looking for like a psychoanalytic version of the inner healing intelligence, and I, I haven't come up with one. Uh -huh. uh, there's not yeah. a lot of talk of somebody uh, sort of on their own, something inside that is sort of... In maybe intuition, I don't know. And I'm wondering if just for you, if any of you, either of you have a reaction to that or something that you've come across or something that might fit that or, or how you're thinking about the inner healing intelligence in sort of a psychoanalytic frame. Yeah, I, I think with when you're thinking about having limited interpretations, that's what is kind of the driving force for like a psychoanalytic process is the, the interpretations and, um, and, and, and that part of the dynamic. Um, which is missing from, from MDMA therapy. So I don't know if I have like a real tie to like what that could be. Well, Jungians, you know, psychoanalytic, it's not the sort of Freudian vein. He kind of yeah. got kicked out. But um, Jungians would just kind of say trust psyche. You know, there, there is something I think equivalent to the, whole, the holotropic. I, I think in a way Stan Groff may have been Jungian. I can't speak for him, but he definitely had um, Jungian interests. And um, the way kind of, uh, that I've come to understand Jungians thinking about healing is that there is a, a movement towards, towards wholeness or the self. It, it is something that's a tension of opposites or a, a, a completion of a, a totality of opposites. So it's inherently uh, wanting to move towards wholeness or completion mm -hmm. of healing. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense to me. There's ideas of, of the true self too, sort of a Winnicottian perspective. Seems to seems to fit. Yeah. That's more in line with the the sort of biological the organism is more in line with the uh, true self and persona to cross back into Jungian ideas is, is more of like a, a blocking of that. Protective. One of many rich conversations that was begun at this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>